Okay, welcome to the EW Podcast. My name is Eric White, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by David Healy. Thank you for joining me, David. Okay, I guess it's good to be here. <laughs> Excellent. So um, maybe you could just start us off with a little introduction of who you are, um, your area of interest, and I think that will segue us nicely into why we're speaking today. Okay. Well, um, I'm a doctor, and uh, before I went into mainstream clinical medicine, I did a PhD on the serotonin system just before the SSRIs came on the stream. Mm-hmm. So this, I was sort of well-placed to get a sense of the kinds of things that were being said about these drugs. And I'd had a bunch of people from the pharmaceutical industry come through the lab that I was working in prior to the launch of these drugs who were saying, well, you know, they're not very good drug older antidepressants, but we still think we'll be able to make money off them. Mm-hmm. So, and the other thing that... Uh, that also happened with that was that uh, given that I worked in the serotonin system and I was a doctor and I was linked to this whole area a little bit, uh, the industry found me a good person to get doctors about these drugs. I was the kind of person to uh, get up and give a talk. And this meant I saw how the industry were operating from the inside. And what actually happens when you begin to talk about the hazards from these drugs uh, respond and of course they often respond well most people think that well hey if you talk about the risk that you're going to get a bomb beneath your car and things like that it's much more a case of they try to make friends with you okay so uh, been able to see that process and how it worked and also been able to see how industry were gearing up to sell drugs by getting people like me to say the things they wanted us to say uh, and that included ghostwriting the articles that uh, we would have our names on. And, you know, this was eye-opening. No, opening is wrong in the sense that it gives you the impression that I fell off, got, got converted, which isn't the case. I think you know, the views I have now are uh, much the same as the views I've always had. It's just uh, I know a lot more about how the system works now. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, so you were, like you said, uh, perfectly positioned to be a spokesperson, they were hoping, the the pharmaceutical industry was hoping for these SSRIs as they were coming online. What, how did you end up being on the other side of that? Well, I didn't end up being on the other side so much. As I say, I still have the same views that uh, my views from uh, the start were that these drugs, there's a view formed by industry, which is that these drugs weren't as good antidepressants as the older antidepressants they replaced, and that a little bit of the they became called antidepressants was that in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was very difficult to market an anxiolytic drug and claim that it wouldn't cause you to get hooked to it, because we had had the benzodiazepine. In the day where I was working at that time, uh, there was a big fuss. Everybody was awfully worried about uh, you know, the benzodiazepines, which were more dependence producing than opioids. You know, they were a threat, a huge threat to uh, the social fabric. And trying to market a new tranquilizer or anxiolytic that wouldn't cause people to get hooked to it was the was too hard a job. Uh, you know, the industry sense was that doctors just wouldn't buy this idea that you couldn't get hooked to a crutch like the the benzodiazepines are an updated version of them. Uh, so that's why these drugs became antidepressants. So I knew all that from the inside. So ending up on the other side isn't quite what happened. It was more a case of people came into me in the clinic and uh, have been put on these drugs and have been put on these drugs by me and became suicidal. And, uh, you know, so I wrote an article saying what I saw and the industry didn't mind that too much either. And uh, <laughs> yeah. that's when they made friends with me. I had, uh, I mean, you know, I was asked to be a consultant for you know, the major companies and this involved very expensive hotels and nice meals and things like that. And they learn all about your family and know what your kids' names are. And they're very friendly. <laughs> and, you know, 
Uh, and um, I had a book then, The Antidepressant Era, which, which, um, which you know, had been doing a lot more to shape the way we view these drugs and the way we viewed healthcare than the big name doctors had been doing, I thought they were doing, okay? Uh, and the industry were actually rather pleased with that as well. The idea that they could do so much to sh shape the way we think. The point where things changed was when um, I got an email in 1997. I had just installed um, CompuServe on a, 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 a computer I had, and pretty well the first email I had came from, from, from California. And it was from a law firm who said, well, look, we're looking for an expert witness in the case of a man who'd been put on Prozac and killed himself and his wife. And, you know, based on some of the papers that you've written, we think you might be able to be an expert for us, okay? And just purely by accident, I would be meeting close to where this law firm was, was based, uh, you know, a few weeks later. Um, I was courtesy of the pharmaceutical industry. I was being... <laughs> business class and uh, said, you know, to um, uh, other guys, I'm happy to meet up with you guys and we can talk about the case. And uh, I got involved. And the, the extraordinary thing, which, I mean, I, I could see was uh, extraordinary then. Um, and I'm kind of surprised now that I, well, maybe surprised that I uh, actually went ahead was that um, they had tried to get experts in the, in the United States and couldn't. No one was prepared to be an expert uh, against Prozac and say that it could cause people to become suicidal or kill people or whatever. So this is why they were reaching out to me. And uh, I said, well, yes, the case looks very convincing. Why not? What can go wrong? Well, what goes wrong is that after that, the industry took a different view of me. And it didn't happen instantly because the court case didn't happen for two years or so. But after it did happen, industry took a different view. Healy was more of a problem than they had thought. So. <laughs> That's kind of a red flag that no one else in the US was willing to come from that angle, huh? What were you thinking at that moment about the state of um, affairs in our country, I guess, and the, the relation that medical, I, I guess, yeah, what did that make you think about um, the state of the medical, mental health field in the, in the United States? Well, I guess what I thought coming from Europe was that you guys were ahead of us. That doesn't mean you're always doing better things than us. It means <laughs> you think that could sue industry, which you aren't doing in Europe, okay? Uh, but, um, it also means that there were things you're doing that weren't so good that you were actually ahead of us on. And I guess the vaccine story to some extent, but but again, this shows where Europe's caught up. Uh, you know, the vaccine story brings this out, which was um, that in the United States, as much as anywhere these days, uh, the most people want to line up behind the powers that be. You know, they they buy what they're told. And uh, that has always hit me as been a little bit surprising. In the United States potentially, uh, though, has more people who are protesting about that than anywhere else. So, you know, while you've got a very strict um, policy in terms of who has to have the vaccines, equally, there's a large number of people who are actually protesting. So it's a mixture of good and bad, you know. Yeah. Yeah, even uh, the protesters of the vaccine, though, I mean, it's questionable what their motives are, if they're just falling along political party lines or if they're actually genuinely concerned about um, being manipulated by power. So who knows? And it's in terms of trying to get a feel for where I come from, that's, that's a good point. But for me, the issue is this, that uh, I've met a few people who have been injured by at the vaccines, okay, and I think they're they're credible, and, and this is very much the way the SSRI story went for me. 
people in the clinic who uh, I didn't have reason to disbelieve what they were saying when they said they went to the stroke and it caused them to become suicidal, or they got hooked to it and couldn't get off it, or they weren't able to function from the sexual point of view. And I said, well, that's fine. You know, once you hold this drug, you'll be fine. They said, no, no, I've been off this drug for three months and I'm still not functioning. Yeah. The people. Okay, so the next issue then is who are you going to believe? Credible people are the evidence that's out there which says these drugs or vaccines or whatever work wonderfully well. Okay. And uh, I find to my surprise that I tend to believe people, you know. Sure, in the job I'm in, you have to figure there's a bunch of people who are trying to fool you. Okay, and there are, you know, there are some weird people out there. There's some food you in order to guess payments for for disabilities or whatever. But for the most part, people are fairly genuine. So unless you get good cause to not believe what they're saying, then I'm inclined to believe it. And one of the oddities is that a lot of doctors find some way not to believe the patient. You know, and um, when the evidence base is out there, whether it's about uh, the vaccines or the SSRIs or whatever, when the evidence base seems to say these things work wonderfully well and are free of harms, and you come along and complain about things going wrong for you, the they'll tend to believe you. One of the, of the ways they won't believe you is, I mean, they'll either outright get hostile <laughs> or else. Mm-hmm. Well, sure, I believe you, but you know this is all in your mind. You know? So you know, that's that's um, yeah, I, and that's actually happening. Whether it's you know, the vaccines or the statins or the SSRIs or whatever, you know, people don't respond, which is uh, a thing that I find surprising. Which is, you know, they don't say, "Well, look, Eric's just come into me and said this awfully interesting thing." You know, isn't that interesting? You know, why don't we try to explore it a bit further? We might learn more if we listen to him and try to explore it and find out if there are other people who are having the same thing happen to them. It it turns you know, the job around from being one where I have a bunch of people who come in with problems that I can't solve into a job where I have a bunch of people who are free researchers coming in the door, and I say, well. This is interesting. Let's work on it. Can you go along and Google it or whatever? And let's see. Yeah, I think one of the things that comes to mind when you say that is um, the difference between anecdotal evidence and statistical evidence, right? You're having one person tell you something, which if they're a credible person, you believe them, that should, it's, you would think that that would bear itself out in the statistics and be something that more people would be aware of. Where's that disconnect happening that you yes. see? Go ahead. Turn, because that's, that's a key point. But let me turn it around. If you come in and talk to me, I have all the data there in front of me. Mm-hmm. If we go by you know, at the control trials and the uh, statistics that come out of those, I don't have all the data. You know, in this trial, I have a guy that's died from burns. Oh, that's interesting. People, well, you know, if you're in a controlled trial, accidents happen. You know, it's tough. But, you know, when you interview his wife, I mean, he's dead, so you have to interview his wife or whatever, and you find out, well, actually, he poured petrol on himself, intending to kill himself, and set fire to it, and five days later died, and they coded it as death by burns. You know, what's happened in the case of the statistics is they've picked a bit of the story, a bit of the data, the fact that ultimately it was the burns that killed him, but they've missed the real story. You know, that's when you have the person in the room with you, or you're the wife, or, you know, uh, uh, like, let's say, for instance, you're in an SSRI, SSRI trial, and after you hold the drug, uh, you know, you're doing well in the trial. And you know, the rating scale scores fall, and you know, your person pretty well, and you know, these drugs suit. And I get to interview you afterwards in the room. You say, Yeah, I was in that trial, and uh, you know, maybe I wasn't doing too bad, 
Um, but, um, you know, uh, I was having problems trying to make love to my partner. Uh, <clears throat> and I thought, of course, it was going to clear up once the drug halted. And uh, then the trial ends and they halt the drug. And uh, six months later, I still can't make love to my partner. If I had known that beforehand, I would have been screaming and chatting at them and saying, this treatment's a disaster for me. Mm -hmm. So it's only if I have you in the room with me that we have all of the data there. In the, in the, the statistical picture, what you've got is a bunch of figures which are abstracted from you and they're only, they only tell a little bit of the actual story. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you correctly, then your claim is that in these, in the case of SSRIs and maybe the vaccines, I know you've written about the vaccines and those trials, um, that researchers are cherry picking data. They're they're massaging the numbers to tell the story that they want it to tell. Is that accurate? Not quite. I mean, there is, but it, no, it's more. Even if the clinical trials weren't done by the pharmaceutical industry, even if they were done by angels, okay? <laughs> so they, is, I mean, in, well, let me go back a bit. In the case of the SSRIs, the industry didn't particularly want them to be antidepressants. They didn't think there was going to be a lot of money there, okay? Uh, they were hoping they'd be weight loss drugs, they'd be antihypertensive drugs and things like that, okay? But ultimately, they figured, well, you know, the only place we're going to get these on the market is as antidepressants. So they run the trials and things like that. And when you're on a trial, the investigators in it are given a bunch of rating scales to fill. And they're being paid for, because they filled these rating scales, okay? And uh, they've got lots of paperwork, okay? And 95% of it is to do with, you know, is there some rating scale, which when we add up the scores, it's going to show the benefit, right? And there's maybe 5% of the time at the end of which I'll ask you were, were you actually having any problems on the drug? And there's one page to fill for any of the problems that you've had. And you might say that, uh, well, maybe I couldn't make love. But, you know, we've asked you, um, well, we've used a depression rating scale earlier on in the interview. And, of course, one of the, one of the things there is if you're depressed, is you know, may lose libido and you may not be interested to make love as much. So I'm not particularly going to think that's a hazard from the pills. I'm going to be thinking more it's part of the illness, okay? And so at that trial, you get something like, the well, you get the industry being able to say that 5% of the people who went on our drug at the end of the trial were, were saying that it had an impact on the way they were able to make love. In fact, we know that, I mean, we knew even before the first trials were done, that close to 100% of the people who take an SSRI within 30 minutes of the first pill are going to have an alteration in the way they make love. Okay, so the clinical trials miss this because the investigators are hypnotized to look at the thing of interest, which is fine, provided you remember at the end of the day, well, you don't have people saying at the end of the day, well, randomized control trials are the gold standard. They tell us what drugs really do. They don't. They're focused on one of the 100 things that a drug does, and they may get the right answer for that, but they're not a good way to tell what, what the drug is doing. You know, there's loads of other things. There's 99 other things, uh, at least, this drug uh, could be doing, and we don't know the answer to that. And if we start thinking that we do know the answer, that we didn't find problems with people being able to make love in this trial, and therefore there are no problems, then we've gone badly wrong. So, so that that's um, an interesting thing to think about because it, are you basically saying then that these things that they're, the things that they're not looking for, which um, might be, let's say, a side effect of the drug, do the, are those the types of things that then become the commercial side effect where they list off all the 20 different things that this drug might also do to you? Are those the kinds of things that you're referencing that they're ignoring through the clinical trials? And then 
later on tacking on some sort of acknowledgement that, hey, this might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of loading. And again, it's not, it's kind of hard to know how much industry are being scurvy knaves, if you see what I mean, or how much it's the culture of the times, because doctors generally aren't saying to industry, look, you know, you guys are really not telling the complete truth. They're actually going along with the industry saying, well, yes, if this trial shows that the drug is antidepressant and there's not many people reporting problems being able to make love on it, then that's the truth. This drug is antidepressant and maybe a few people uh, actually have a problem trying to make love on it. Doctors aren't, aren't aware that in the clinical trial process, we can miss things that are happening to everyone. Okay, we can just miss them. You know, so um, industry, as you say, then mention in the label of the drug that, well, yes, there have been reports that, uh, you know, people aren't able to make love uh, on our drug. And the curious thing about that, and this brings us back to the point you asked first, the anecdotes point, which is unlike FDA, industry have a legal duty if there's a report to them, you know, that I'm having a problem trying to make love on this drug or, uh, you know, um, I was on this drug while I was pregnant and my baby now has a heart problem. They have a legal duty to follow things up. And when they follow things up, that means get hold of you and get hold of your medical record and ask you questions. And when they can't find any other way to explain what's going on other than how our drug caused it, they, they then put it in the label saying, our drug, the, you know, we have reports, okay, that our drug can cause it. And when doctors and patients read the label of the drug, where it says, we have reports that this can happen, they read, oh, this is, they've had reports from the Church of Scientology or the anti-vaxxers and things like that. They don't realize that people like David Healy and Eric White, who industry have interviewed and have been convinced by the story we tell that, yes, their drug is, is actually causing this. So it'll, there in the label, it can depend on doctors, not of what's really being said. Yeah. Isn't that a trade-off that we just have to kind of accept with medicine? Like we're working with things that are at the cutting edge of these are non-natural. These are not things we evolved with. These are not things in our evolutionary history. So there's kind of a uh, a risk that we're taking on inherently by saying that we're going to develop products that interact with the body in a way that is unnatural, but intended to help. So there's some risk that we have to accept with that, right? Like we can't just say we only want drugs that have no side effects. Otherwise, we'd never we'd never get any drugs. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. And uh, three words. There's um, the word poison, the word medicine, and the word sacrament. Okay. Now, um, a poison is a thing that harms you. Okay. And uh, essentially, medicines are all poisons. You know, we're going to harm you intending to do good. We're going to give you a treatment that is going to kill loads of your um, kind of cells, hoping that it will kill the tumor cells more than it kills the other cells, okay? We hope to bring good out of it, but we're actually doing harm. And it's a bit like uh, when we put you to sleep for an, an operation. There's a real risk that the simple putting you uh, actually to sleep for um, an hour or two or even more is going to kill you. But that's a risk that generally we all think is worthwhile to take if you're really at risk, okay? Now, the word medicine used to, we used to at least partly know that we were taking risks when we took medicines. What it now means it's a uh, sacrament and they're things that can only do good you know they they save your life they don't have harms which is curious because even you know the catholic church these days recognizes that the 
Eucharist, if it's got gluten in it, might do some harm, you know. But the pharmaceutical industry have, well, I mean, it, it isn't just them on their own. It's maybe all of us. We want to think what we're getting is going uh, you know, to save our life and that it's free of harms, which is not realistic. So whether it's the work of industry to kind of persuade us of this, or whether it's things about the culture in which we live these days, what we have is uh, a culture in which we tend to think drugs can do anything and that they can do it without things going wrong. Yes, there's a small chance things could go wrong, but, you know, um, it isn't actually going to affect me kind of thing. There's so many directions. I, I'm like just so many different ways we could go here. Um, but I think for the sake of this conversation, I'd like to maybe drill in more on the SSRIs. Um, and so you mentioned the culture in which we live in and um, wanting to believe that we can have a magic bullet, bullet fix to our health problems. Um, what do you... How do you talk to people that are in that mindset? I mean, I'm sure that in your work, you have many people uh, contacting you asking, should I be taking these drugs? Should I get off of them? Asking for your opinion on this. I assume that some percentage of them are historically uh, obedient to the powers that be and to authority. How do you talk to people about this um, in the real world, in, in real life, real uh, medical situations. What is your advice to people who are on these drugs and wondering if they should continue them? There's two groups of people. One is the group who come asking for drugs. I mean, they aren't on them yet. Uh, they come because they think they should be on them, that these things will help. And uh, they tend to have a little bit of a problem when they come to me and that I'll be a little bit slow. I mean, I will be saying these things come with risk. Now, more, usually I've got, I mean, you know, the kind of person I'll see will be a person who's been on these pills for years and is thinking about trying to get off them. But there is a group as well who are trying to get on them. And if they've got to the point of thinking that these things could be helpful because all their friends are on them or whatever, then they're not terribly keen to hear the message that, you know, this may not be a good thing, that, you know, the nervous problem you've got is one that, is likely to clear up of its own accord. Uh, I'm happy to keep on seeing you. And if things don't clear up, then, you know, I'm happy that we could turn to pills. You know, there are pills that we can use. But all things being equal, if you get well without the pills, you, chances are you're going to do better in the longer run. Okay? So one of the things that's been kind of surprising, and this is one of the differences at the moment between being over here and being in Europe, which is people demand the pills. If they get a no from me, or if they get told, well, look, let's just give it a bit of time. Let's see how things go. And if they don't clear up, then yes, we use pills. They tend to go elsewhere. They're not interested to engage. They're not interested to, 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 to think a bit more about things. They made up their mind. They want the pills. Okay. And I'm just there to, 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 Give them the pills. Okay? You're just a, a drug dealer. <laughs> sure. And um, the other group then is the group who have maybe been through that path and found out after a while, well, actually, these things don't work as well as I was told, or they don't suit, or I've been on them for a long time. And it looks like it's going to be hard to get off them. And um, so engaging with that can be tricky as well. Uh, there's a lot of doctors, what you come up against is uh, when the antidepressant you're on doesn't work, uh, a lot of doctors have given people extra pills to boost the antidepressant that they're on. And, uh, and they'll say, well, you know, maybe things aren't working quite as right because you're bipolar. So let's throw a mood stabilizer or two in. And hey, you're now saying you're a bit tired and you can't focus as well. Let's throw an ADHD drug in as well, too. And you get people on six or eight or nine drugs. And uh, that's a little bit like trying to defuse a bomb, you know. Um, so it, um, yeah. And I think that's where things are going, which is five, 10 years ago, maybe more in Europe than over here, you'd have had people just on one drug. 
Now, over here, there's a lot of people who are on four, five, six drugs. Um, are more, and these are just uh, drugs for, uh, you know, um, for the one mental health problem. These people don't have three illnesses, but they end up with three or four labels. They end up with six or eight drugs. And trying to get them off them, some people are reasonably happy to try and get, you know, uh, at the drugs down. Others aren't. A lot of the doctors who've put them on these drugs take it as a, well, they're a bit wary about the idea that we might want to try and get people off drugs. And they maybe seem to see it as, well, if he's saying that this person needs to come off all the drugs are on, that must mean I have done something wrong. And, you know, will I be legally liable for this? So they don't always welcome the idea about trying to reduce uh, 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 the medication burden. Um, so it's it's a complex mix. And uh, and all I can say is things seem to be getting worse, not better. There's the risk with a thing like this, with you know, the conversation we're having here now, is that we're going to be in an echo chamber. We're both thinking a little bit the same kind of way. Uh, and the people who tune in are going to be thinking a little bit the same way as well. And we're all going to think things are improving because we hear other people saying things that are roughly like the things that we think. But things aren't improving. They're actually getting worse. The number of meds that people are on the whole time is going up and up and up. And uh, it's hard to know how we're going to get up uh, on that. Uh, yeah. I'd to turn things backwards a bit is is even harder so yeah that um that makes me think of my own experience um with the pharmaceutical industry um in college i had a suicidal episode that landed me in inpatient therapy um and it was <laughs> something i'll never forget being in that in that place was just every twice a day everyone would line up at this little window with a little cup and you'd go and you'd, they'd look at your, find your name, they'd pour your drugs in there, send you on your way. And you'd just be, you know, left to veg out on these drugs that, uh, you know, there was never anyone in there in, in my journey through, you know, my own struggles that was, um, taking, I, I keep saying evolution, but an evolutionary approach to things almost where it's, you know, looking more at the base level of how, who am I? How do I feel? What's going on in my life? It was more so, well, maybe this isn't the right drug for you. You know, maybe we need to switch you to this one. Maybe we should add this one on, like you say. Um, and so it's, it's really hard I'm lucky, I think, in that I, I managed to find a community and I managed to find purpose in my life and deal with the things that were troubling me and thank for, thankful for that. But how, how, how you say that things are getting worse, but I do hear more people talking like you, like you were saying. So is there a movement that you see penetrating the industry of people like you, like myself, who are saying, wait a minute, this isn't the right way. You're just sad. You're just an energetic person. Do you see that happening? Or do you see kind of the industry doubling down and uh, continuing on this path? Yeah. Well, I think I see things getting worse. But part of the problem is the good people. All the good people talking about conflict of interest and you know, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, Clinical trials are great. We have ways of what drugs really do if we, if only industry didn't have their grubby paws on them. Now, there's a lot of things the industry does that are pretty awful. Uh, it goes right articles. They hide uh, the clinical trial data. And this is all true of the vaccines as well. You know? uh, the story is as bad as, as any of the other mental health. So industry haven't changed and aren't going to change um, in a hurry. But the people who make it all work for industry are the good people. It's a bit like um, people from Luther to Martin Luther King to Gandhi have always said, you know, the real problem is the good people in this world, the ones who are 
going to church and read the Bible and things like that and figure that, uh, you know, everything will be okay if we just stick to the Bible, okay? And there's a lot of doctors and things like that who think, yes, RCTs and all are just great. Uh, and part of the problem here is they want a Bible. They don't want the idea of, well, it's just Eric and me in the room here. Um, you know, they want something out there beyond them and beyond you, which points them toward the truth. And at the end of the day, the only truth there is, is my truth, having lived, lived through things and seen people like you end up in the state you're in, and then your truth, having been through the kinds of things that you just said you've been through. And it's, um, you know, that's, you know, we've got patients coming to you know, the mental health system or even to, you know, the health system who want help from the guru, not realizing that the guru, him or herself, is also, uh, depending on you know, the Bible or the RCTs or things like that, rather than actually being a guru, knowing a little bit more than the patient coming for help does about how the world really works. And I guess once you put it that way, you realize, well, there's very few gurus around, very few people who know how the world really works. You know, they're all looking for an external kind of uh, a support. And uh, from that point of view, the good people, as I say, you know, the ones who think, well, there is a way to the truth and the light. It's called RCTs, and everything will be just fine, provided industry didn't run these RCTs. But, you know, um, things uh, wouldn't be just fine, provided industry uh, didn't run the RCTs. It really does come back to liking people and being able to work with people, being able to sit in a room with a person without having to depend on putting up you know, the plaques in the wall saying, I'm a doctor of this, or I'm a doctor of that, or I've been to this university or that university or whatever. You know, so. And just for clarification for the listeners, RCTs, you're referring to randomized controlled trials, correct? Yes. Cool. So I guess one of the things that keeps coming up in my mind is, do do you think that SSRIs work in some cases? Yeah, they clearly do. And uh, they work, interestingly, they work awfully quickly. I mean, if you read the books, okay, uh, they say that, uh, you know, these drugs can take weeks to work, you know, so you need to keep on having them, even though you may be feeling bad, even though you may be feeling worse than you were before you went to them, you need to keep on having them because they take weeks to work. Well, there's two or three things that uh, say that that's wrong. One is, <clears throat> if you take your very first SSRI pill, okay, and check, most people will be genitally numb to some extent within half an hour of the first pill. So it's doing things, pretty uh, clear things, pretty quickly. One of the other things that brought it home to me very early on, because I bought into the idea that you know, the antidepressants, unlike uh, you know, the benzodiazepines, take a while to work. Okay, the benzodiazepines, you take one and 15 minutes later, you're feeling nice and calm and relaxed. It's a bit like having a gin and tonic or whatever. Uh, but, you know, the antidepressants take ages to work. Uh, but we did a healthy volunteer trial many years ago, 20 odd years ago or more. And uh, a bunch of my colleagues, the doctors in the unit, the senior nursing staff and things like that, they were all interested to get involved to see, you know, well, just what it was like to be on the drugs that they were giving to, you know, at the patients, okay? Now, in this case, the, they didn't all get uh, the same drug and they didn't know which drug they got, okay? So they were blind to all that, but they were on the pills and um, most of them reported early on that, you know, yes, after a few days, I could feel that this thing chilled me out. You know, the kinds of things that would get me upset Previously, before I went on the pill, you know, I was not getting as upset as quickly. And, you know, I can see how this could be useful. Okay, this is in the case of the, the SSRI that they could have been on but didn't know they were on. But the really interesting thing, you know, that was that um, they were working. I mean, they were on these pills while they were actually working on the ward. And within 
24 to 48 hours, we had patients asking us, is Dr. Roberts on a pill? He's different. I can see a difference in him, you know, uh, to uh, the usual thing. So, you know, the patients could s- s- spot within one or two days that people on these pills were were changed, you know, and and uh, that you know, the change could be a useful change. There was also people within a few days who became very agitated. Uh, so, you know, these these drugs act pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's touch and go. If you've actually been depressed and you go on the drugs, uh, it's touch and go whether, um, you know, you're going to be any better after six weeks on these drugs than if you weren't on any treatment at all. I mean, it comes back to the fact that a lot of us recover kind of spontaneously anyway. Yes, the chilling out effect uh, may be a useful thing, um, but, you know, it's hard to know how useful it is in the longer run. So. It's a, it seems like a very tough thing to uh, define clear edges on um, because it is very subjective to the individual and it's going to vary quite a bit. Um, and there's also this, I think, you know, I know several people who are on um, SSRIs and have been on for a long time. And they've asked me before, like, should I, do you think I should stop taking these? And I was like, I don't know. I knew what I wanted to say. I was like, yeah, stop taking them. You're, you've got your life together. You can stop, get off them. But, you know, I don't want to do cause any harm, of course. Um, but I think that there's a certain level of uh, fear even um, of returning to the person that they were, even if they've gone through a bunch of different modalities and done the work to uh, improve their outlook on life. There's still a certain fear that if I go off this drug, I'm going to revert back to my former way of being. And I wonder what you have to, what your response to something like that would be. Yeah, no, that's, and that's a really good point. And um while you were asking the questions, what I was thinking was, well, it isn't just the person themselves um, who's nervous when are, uh, are reverting back. A lot of people these days are on pills and doing therapy also. And a lot of people in therapy, even before they go on pills, get told by the therapist that you need a pill as well. I mean, it's awfully common that people get referred along by therapists for a pill. And if they raise the issue about halting the pills with the therapist that they're seeing some months later or years later, um, therapists rarely say, yes, that's a good idea. They tend to say, no, you know, you really need these things kind of thing. Uh, Which is all strange and odd because 20, 30 years ago, Therapists were the people who are hostile to pills were saying, you know, no, you shouldn't be on pills. You should be doing therapy instead. That's all changed. And um, yeah, there, there, there is a, a great, uh, there's, a, there's an old cartoon, which, well, not an old cartoon, but it's, uh, it's um, I don't exactly know how old it is, but it's a cartoon where you see a person going along to a sh- shrink like me. And um, you see them saying um, to uh, 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 the shrink that, um, you know, the, the, um, they're asking, well, they're, they've just been told, obviously, that it would be a good idea for them to halt their drugs. And they're saying, Stop my drugs. Uh, is that legal? Okay. And um, the so that that refers to the bit that you're mentioning, but the other aspect to it is um, at the doctor. I mean, you could say the same thing about the doctor also. Doctors are not in the business of encouraging you to hold the drugs, saying to you that. You know, these drugs are a crutch. They may have been helpful um, for a period, uh, but it's about time that you come off them. 
they uh, they um, uh, take. I mean, you know, they're, they're in uh, the frame of mind where, if asked to take responsibility for the prescribing uh, of drugs, they're asking, "Is that legal?" You know, um, they they yeah, and they're obviously quick. <clears throat> to, they will, my guess is nine out of 10 will say, if you begin to feel worse when you come off the SSRIs, that that's your illness coming back. And it just proves you need to be on these drugs um, maybe forever. It's a bit like taking insulin. You wouldn't be saying to me, don't take insulin, would you? Um, And in fact, they should be recognizing that, well, if you are beginning to feel worse as you're coming off these drugs, this probably means that you're dependent on them and it's more critical than ever that we think, uh, A, but can we get you off them? And it may be that we have to opt for saying, well, no, we can't, you know, but it, it, it should be recognized, I think, that, you know, we have left you on these pills for too long and uh, the problem now isn't that you've got an underlying nervous problem. The problem now is you've got a pill-induced nervous problem. Yeah. How, how can people take control of their health, though? I, I imagine there's someone who's listening to this who maybe has thought about getting off their pills, but they're seeing a therapist who says, no, you need the pills. There are people in their uh, um, social circles who are close to them and know they're on them, encourage them to take it, but they still have this doubt. How can someone take control, take control back of their life and... Um, <clears throat> in a healthy way, explore if taking the pills, uh, if removing the pills from their life is the best decision? Yeah. Well, I think um, without trying to tell people how they should actually live their lives, okay? Uh, I mean, pills will be um, uh, 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 the right thing for a bunch of people. So I'm not in the business of saying, you, you know, you oughtn't to be on pills. Pills actually have the place and they can do good. But I think what we've got is an us problem, okay? And this goes back to the culture thing, which is, you know, it's not just the SSRI that you're on that you may need to take uh, 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 responsibility for, or it's not just the statin or whatever. It's the fact that, and it isn't just the people who take these pills, it's the doctors who dish them out also. And... The, what's common to all these pills is the fact that the literature we depend on is ghostwritten, and there's no access to the data from the clinical trials that these ghostwritten articles claim show that you know, the drugs work wonderfully well. Okay, um, so and and even you know the ghost writers um, don't get to see the the clinical trial data either. Okay, so that's the bigger picture. There's a common cause issue here between the person who's got asthma and is on pills and the person who's got raised lipid levels and who's on pills and the person who's maybe depressed and who's on pills, which is, you know, rather than saying the pills are good or the pills are bad or they can cause harm or whatever, it's more a case of trying to get over to people uh, something that they don't hear when you say it, which is there's no access to the clinical trial data. There's, and all we've got is ghostwritten articles. And this whole, I mean, you know, I don't want to turn people off totally, but this holds for, you know, uh, the vaccines as well. We do not have access to the clinical trial data. People think FDA have access to the data. They don't. And when you begin to look at the data, if you get access to any bits at all, you know, who, what you realize is what we're being told is very different to what you see in the clinical trial data. You know, so it's just trying to get the coin to drop for people, which is, you know, it, it, yes, it's great to have pills, but before we take them, we need to know what the score really is. And you're saying to me that, you know, I don't have any rights to see these data. And my doctor doesn't have any rights to see the data. 
and FDA haven't seen the data. Holy hell, you know, this is just not right. You know, so it's not really an argument about any one pill and should we uh, should we have to be having it. It's much more a case of this is crazy. You know, <laughs> it's totally crazy. So, yeah, I guess you're getting to something at the heart of my question, I guess, which is how. You know, there's speaking from my own personal experience, and I'm sure for many people, even if that data was available, I wouldn't have the skills or the time or the knowledge to draw conclusions from that data. So there is a certain amount of um, blind trust that the general population has to put into people like yourself, people, uh, organizations like the FDA. You know, we can't all be our own data analysis, even if that data were available and and uh, and transparent. So how how can someone like me, who has a full time job, maybe someone has kids and a family, can't make these decisions for themselves with the, the the base level information? How can we navigate this crazy uh, medical institution that is? Uh, you know, incentivized by money and profits, and how can we make better decisions for ourselves whenever that's that's the case? Yeah, well, it comes back to we're at a point where you cannot believe. I mean, the New England Journal of Medicine used to be for most doctors the Bible. You know, if it's there in the New England Journal of Medicine, it has to be true. Well, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, when it comes to drugs and vaccines, is the greatest purveyor of misinformation that there is, okay? And people just have to wake up to that idea. And how to wake them up is the issue, I think. When you say that, you know, people like you can't analyze clinical trial data, so they depend on people like me who are experts in this area. Actually, that's not the case. The clinical trial data is pretty easy to analyze. You could get a bunch of first year college students and things like that and sit them down in a room. And if you gave them all the clinical trial data, they'd be able to work out the score pretty quickly. You know, it's not rocket science analyzing clinical trials. And they'd be able to look at the stuff and say, well, look, this report here doesn't make sense. I need to phone up the person who was in this trial, this person here, and ask them just what actually happened to them. You know, and that's the kind of thing that FDA are doing. That's the kind of thing that we figure FDA are doing. When the company sends in their stuff, we figure there's good people in FDA who are able to do things like get hold of Eric White and ask him, look, Eric, what actually happened to you on that pill? FDA aren't doing that. If they were, there'd be some hope. You could say, well, yeah, we can let it. FDA look after us. But, and this is what it comes back to, in a sense, we're behaving childishly you know we're saying we've got daddy there and he's going to look after us you know he's going to make sure that we're safe and everything's going to be fine we don't have daddy there that's what it comes down to you know um fda aren't doing that kind of job they're just bureaucrats that tick boxes and want a quiet life they have no expertise they have no real expertise in analyzing what the clinical trial uh, has shown they've got no more expertise than you. They take what the company writes, what the company says about what the clinical trial has shown, and they say, okay, this looks okay. Uh, if we, what, what they're really saying is, if we get sued, we have a paper trail here that we can just tick. So we're not being looked after by anyone. And that pushes us back to, again, the point one of the points you made early on, which is there's the anecdotes. There's what's happened to you and what the evidence out there actually says. And we're in a position where really people need to realize that the only thing you can trust is what you think is happening to you. And if you're there figuring, well, it looks black and the doctor is saying, no, it's actually white, you, you know, you've got to actually decide, well, do I think he's right or not, or is it black? And if you think it's black, you need to stick to it. That's not an easy ask, I don't think, <laughs> especially in this uh, world of 
social media where everyone's uh, in their own information bubble and we are all constantly being refed the narratives that we believe in. Um, I don't know. It, it seems almost quixotic to think that we would get to a point where people are thinking for themselves on every issue like this um, instead of just looking for, you know, giving up some trust, making the trade off of trusting someone to have a little bit of your time and, and focus back, you know, you're making a trade off. I'm saying, I'm going to let the FDA make this decision and I'm going to in turn get um, the freedom to do other things. I'm not going to have to sit here and look through this data. Um, and this is, I think the people who are really failing you aren't, I mean, I did I sort of like fingered FDA there, uh, but you know, they're not well paid. And they're usually not terribly motivated. Uh, the people who are really failing you are the doctors you go to, who are being very well paid and, uh, you know, um, given a very plush, cushy life, uh, which is all fine if they were really operating the way you would want them to be, which is they're the experts. I mean, when you go to a lawyer, you want a person who really knows the legal details, sort of all the books that you don't want to wade through and all the previous cases you want, that kind of person. And you figure that's what you're actually getting. Um, when you go to a doctor, you figure you're getting the same thing, but you're not. You're getting a person who is paid a huge amount of money uh, and shouldn't be opting for the easy life, which is you know, thinking there's too many people coming in here on this drug who are really doing very poorly. I need to find out what's going on. They just aren't doing that for us, you know. So it's maybe time for us to start thinking about, um, well, <laughs> you know, do we really need them? Are, are they more of a hindrance than a help? I mean, it's a bit like, let me put like this to you. Um, the SSRIs are all antihistamines, and a lot of the antihistamines are, are SSRIs. If you go and take an SSRI antihistamine from over the counter and you react poorly to it, you know, most people have the sense to just stop it. They don't keep on with it. But if you come to me and uh, you get put on an SSRI antihistamine uh, and I say to you, oh, listen, I hear that you're feeling bad, but this is just what these drugs do. You need to keep on having it. You get trapped. It's the relationship with me that traps you into having this pill when your common sense is saying, don't have it. And even worse again, if you take it from over the counter and you come to your partner or your mother or whatever, and you say, I'm feeling bad. Uh, she says to you, oh, you shouldn't be on that junk, you know, anyway. But if you get put in a pill by me and you come home to your mother and say, look, I'm feeling bad on this, and say, oh, your wife or husband or whatever, and you say, I'm feeling bad on it, uh, they say, well, you should be doing what the doctor says. You know, don't, don't think for yourself. You need to do what the doctor tells you, which is just crazy. I mean, this prescription-only thing, which gives doctors a very cushy living, would be fine if these guys, our girls, were heroes, you know, who were really there for you. But they're not. So they're the people who are really failing us. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that this problem of um, the, of uh, over-reliance on pharmaceuticals um, for perhaps normal human things um, or things that don't merit that sort of uh, – intervention. It, it's happening at, th there's, the problem is kind of happening at three levels. There's the institutional level, which I guess would be the uh, manipulation or the um, hiding or not following up on the data, not, not being completely forthright with what they're finding in their studies. And then there's the second layer, which is the institution's interaction with society, which is kind of what we've just been talking about in this last bit. And then there's the third layer of like what's happening in society of people being, you know, right now, a lot of people are very hopeless. A lot of people feel despair and are depressed daily. And it's not 
because they're mentally ill. It's because their life sucks. It's because they don't aren't having their basic needs fulfilled. And so you have these three things interacting in a very complex way. And I wonder if you were to be the mental health and despair czar for, for the world, how would you go about um, addressing these at those three levels? What do you see is that interaction? Like what, what, what would be your prescription, I guess, for better lack of a word? Well, Okay, well, one of the things is over the last two or 300 years, we, maybe even more, we've um, developed a lot of techniques, technologies and things like that to help us. And these things have made us wealthier and, you know, have helped health also. Uh, so, you know, there's been progress. But um, one of the difficulties we've got is that techniques tend to 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 displace us we've got to remember if we're using them that we're using a tool and uh you know that that at the end of the day it's the us that counts. let me give you an awfully simple example this is this is being a little obscure when um, the active persons came on stream, first of all, they're uh, a technique. You know, these pills can do this, this, and this, and they can help. They brought rating scales with them. And it's a bit easier to see in the case of the rating scale than it is in the case of the pill, maybe, which is that, you know, previous to the rating scales, uh, you would come in to see me and I would ask you things. Well, you'd bring a problem into me okay and um, I would ask you about the problem and things like that and you'd say you weren't sleeping you had all of you know, the features of being being depressed but actually you know once I asked about the context in which you're living you know the problems poverty three or four jobs broken marriage this that, and the other I begin to see why you aren't sleeping and why you have all you know other symptoms and that the pill isn't really the answer to it okay but with a rating scale, what we've got is a thing that looks scientific. Okay, it's got a bunch of boxes to score and add up and give us a figure at the end of the day. Okay, and the first rating scales were introduced to remind me about some of the things that I really should ask you about, but just some of the things. The idea was they were going to fit into the interview we had. Okay, but when people begin to think about how to make health kind of systems work better, they think, well, there's no point David Healy asking Eric about what kind of sports he plays or how he's getting on with his partner or whatever. You know, we've got an objective rating scale here. And the interview between Eric and David should be all about just asking these questions. This is going uh, you know, to be scientific and it's going to be quality in the, sen in the industry sense of, every single person I see is going to get the same interview, okay? Um, and that looks good from, a, from an industry point of view, but what's happening is the industry realized that a ranking scale like that or a test, any technique like this can be used to help us do the interview, to do the best interview we can, which is one which looks at the context and makes sure I ask all the kinds of questions which could be to do with uh, an illness or else it could replace that interview so that rather than me helping you live the life you want to live, I'm now helping you live the life that Pfizer wants you to live, okay? And that's true of all techniques. So, I mean, at the end of the day, the issue is we don't not want techniques. If we're going to solve climate change and things like that, we want a bunch of techniques that are going to help us. You know, we want to understand how things work and we want things that can help reverse things that need reversing. And it's been the same with our health. We want techniques. No one doesn't want cures for illnesses, but we've got to make sure they're helping us live the lives that we want to live rather than live the lives that some corporation wants us to live. And the, the oddity is when it comes to the wider world, Greta Thunberg and people like that, sort of, uh, I mean, for years, for 
20 or 30 years, and but but more so lately, Greta Thunberg and people like that have been helping us push back against techniques, trying to make sure that the technologies and techniques we use help us live the lives we want to live, help us make sure the planet is the way we want it to be, rather than using the planet for some corporation's purposes. We've been able to push back against that. We're not winning the war, but we're certainly pushing back. But when it comes to health, it's just the opposite. We are consuming more chemicals and we're not consuming them to help us live the lives that we want. To. Well, we're not ending up living the lives that we want to live. We're ending up living the lives Pfizer and other people want us to live. So there's this curiosity when it comes to health, which is while we're trying to clean up the environment out there, we're polluting the environment in here. And uh, so from a mental health sour point of view, I'd be saying something like, Mental illnesses are very rare. Distress is terribly common. And we shouldn't be uh, using rating scales and things like that to get you to take pills. It really is a political issue. What's getting up in the way of an us living the way we want us to live? And it is, I mean, if you focus too much on, I want to make sure I've got things to help me live the life that I want to live, you're going to go wrong. It really it does have to be an us component to it, which is I'm not going to live in the life that I want to live if everybody else isn't, well, isn't moving uh, at the same way. You know, we have to all be in a pad together. Yeah. Yeah. It just comes to mind that as you're speaking that we've kind of, got, we've, got a political problem and we're trying to solve it with pharmaceutical interventions. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't seem to work. No, 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 sure. And, and this is you know, the wider picture. You've got a technocratic um, approach towards trying to solve the world's problems, which is, you know, whether it's the wider environment or us, we need techniques, technologies, but it really is a case of the people getting back together and trying to see how do you make these things work for us? Yeah, I guess it's um, hopefully things like the internet and people creating virtual communities and uh, the closing down of physical space into the virtual space will allow people to share information more directly and to be able to make better decisions instead of having to have that information funneled through some institution. Um, like I'm thinking, I'm thinking of forums and, and, you know, places where people might go to talk about their real experience with an SSRI or to talk about, you know, I experienced this with the vaccine. I didn't experience this where you can say, forget the data. I want to hear from real people. Maybe that the internet space is a good, a, a good, good omen for something like that. I don't know. The internet did feel like that. 10 years ago or more, it did feel like a tool that was going to help us live the lives that we wanted to live. But it's now with Google and Facebook, maybe more Facebook than Google, it's become a world where Facebook uh, is, um, is a tool that helps us live the lives that other people want us to live. Uh, so it's hard to get a grip on that. And it's very hard to know exactly how to get a grip on it. Well, Dr. D David, sorry, you asked me to call you Dr. David before. <laughs> I want to be respectful of your time. We're kind of nearing the end here. Um, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. This is definitely a topic of interest from my own personal experience. And as soon as I heard about you, I was like, oh, I need to pursue a conversation with him. So thank you very much for joining me. Well, it's been good fun, and you've asked all of the right questions. <laughs> That's good. Is there anything else you want to add to end here? Uh, any no, no. Other than just to let people know that it has been a good interview for me anyway. I feel it's very comfortable, and I think we could go on chatting for ages. So. Yeah. yeah, well, maybe we'll have to do this again in the future. I'll have to dive more into your work and uh, see if there's something else to talk to you about. Okay, that'll be good. Cool. 
All right. Thank you, David. I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you for listening, everybody.